makes you uncomfortable, Professor Clark is fine. Uh, so what we'll do today is we'll go through the course outline uh, and all of that stuff, and then we'll get into the lecture uh, material as well. Um, okay, so the course is on Moodle, uh, so you can go directly to Moodle, uh, or you can find my website, and I link to it from my website. So if you go to courses, I have a tab, uh, then you'll find it. You can also see earlier versions of the course uh, when it wasn't on Moodle. If it's on Moodle, you won't be able to see it. It should be visible on Moodle. Has anyone seen it? A few people, yeah? Okay, okay. So then it should work. Uh, I just have to do uh, proof. What is this, by the way? Does anyone know what this is called? All right, so two-factor authentication. Why is that a good thing? Is it more secure than not having it? Why? Okay, so single point of failure would be password. password. Okay, so in this case, the idea is that you'd have to compromise two things. You'd have to know my password, plus you'd have to steal my phone or get access to my like Microsoft Authenticator app that you could, you could log in. Is it worse in any regard? Should everyone use two-factor? You wanna read the New York Times, you wanna log in, you should have two-factor authentication? Okay, so why, why not? Okay, so the idea is that it's for where you want higher security because why though? Like, why don't we use it? Why don't, we don't want to use it for lower security because? Yeah, okay, so it's, it has poor usability. Okay, so uh, users get tired of it. You're digging your phone out. If you ever find yourself without a phone, if you ever have a final exam in Fulberg uh, and there's no cell reception and you were counting on having the three hours to do some work, you can't log in, all those types of things. Anyways, uh, I, there's a reason I asked that, uh, and we'll talk about it next class. Uh, not this class, but anyways. Okay, uh, so uh, the Moodle looks like this. Uh, pretty straightforward, we'll go through everything. Uh, so I'll go through the course outline and, and things like that, assignments, projects. Uh, before I do, I'll just note that I do record the lecture, so this is recording now. Uh, what you'll get is a screen capture of the lecture. It will be on YouTube. Uh, so if you ever miss a lecture, uh, then no problem. You can catch up uh, just by watching it. Uh, the lectures themselves are just handwritten notes, uh, so I don't use slides. Um, and uh, I just, I like it better. I find it, I teach at a more reasonable pace. I would go too fast if I had slides. Uh, and so that's... Uh, what the what the lectures consist of. Also, if you're studying for the exam or whatever, you want to ever go back uh, and go over anything, uh, it's there. Uh, if you want to take a look at what the notes look like or the videos look like from last year's, uh, so if you want to work ahead, for example, uh, they're here. This is a very large PDF, so it takes a while to download. Maybe I'll, I'll kill it, but you can you can uh, look at that on your own. And uh, the playlist of videos are, are there as well from last year. Uh, there's, well, let's just go through the course outline. I, th I think we'll pick up all the other things I want to talk about. Okay, uh, so there's office hours. Uh, they're going to be virtual. Uh, it's shared between my two courses. Uh, it's on Zoom. Uh, when you join the call, you'll see one of two things. You might see that you're in a waiting room. Uh, that means I'm with another student. Unfortunately, you can't really see like how many people are in the waiting room or how long or anything like that, so you just have to be patient. Uh, Zoom could be better in that regard, but it's not. Um, so that's fine. If you see like hosts is waiting to connect, that means I'm not online. There is a chance I forgot or something like that. Uh, and so feel free, give me five minutes and if I'm still not there, you really need to talk to me, just drop me an email. Uh, if you ever wanna email me instead of going to office hours, that's fine too. So you can just email me anytime with your questions. Uh, after class, you can ask your questions. 
during class, you can ask questions. So if it's about sort of individual things like assignments and projects, then after class, email or office hours, uh, they're good for that. And if it's about the material of the course itself, then during classes is best for that. Um, so we all found ourselves here Friday night and we found ourselves in the right room. Uh, okay, so I won't go through this. Uh, so there's no prerequisites uh, for the course. Uh, there's no textbooks or anything, so everything will be self-contained. Uh, there are some additional readings that I post on Moodle. Those are not required. So they're just there if maybe you didn't understand what I said in class and you want more information. Maybe you're just interested in it or you're doing a project on it so you want to have some more detail or whatever the case may be. Then you can go and you can look through that stuff. Um, so it's, it's not required. Um, my lecture notes will be posted. There, there is a possibility that there's some hiccup, like sometimes the video file gets corrupted or something weird happens. Uh, and so I, I can't give you 100% guarantee that, that every lecture will be there and recorded, but you know, I've been doing this for five, seven years and maybe it's happened three times or something that we've lost a lecture. And there's always last year's lectures and they don't change that much from year to year. So you wouldn't be completely stuck. Um, but anyways, it's just on a best effort uh, only. Uh, if you're from Quality, you're welcome to take this course. Or if you're from outside of CISE, uh, that's fine. Uh, quality students sometimes struggle a little bit, uh, or they, they, they don't really necessarily understand all the concepts. Uh, but they come through in the end of the course and get a good mark. Um, so my feeling is that if you're in Quality and taking the course, you might be prepared to do some of that additional reading and, and look at things and, and do more Googling of things that you don't understand. Uh, but there's absolutely no reason why you can't uh, take the course, pass it, and do well in it. Uh, in terms of grading, so there will be no midterm, uh, just a, one final exam. Uh, there will be a project. I'll spend some time talking about the project uh, today. Uh, and then there'll be two assignments. Uh, this year I decided just to use the same assignments as last year, so they, or last term. So they're already posted there. You can see the due dates, you can see everything. I won't talk about them though until I cover the material in the course that you need to, to do the assignment. So uh, assignment one, in about two weeks from now, not this lecture, not next lecture, but the lecture after. Actually, no, maybe at the end of next lecture you could understand assignment one. And then uh, it's due about three weeks after that. So generally, you'll, you'll have at least two weeks from when you can understand the material and do it uh, to, to when it's due. Um, but I'll, I'll go through the assignments like later. Uh, and uh, the assignments are individual. Uh, so everyone does their own assignment. And the project is a group uh, project. Or sorry, it's, it's individual or group. So you have the option. Um, Okay, so these are just the material that, that we'll cover. Uh, they'll make more sense later. Uh, if you need any resources, so most course outlines have the same list. Um, so for example, students with disabilities, if you need special accommodations during an exam or something like that, uh, you should contact the office early uh, and then they'll let me know and then, uh, then we can have those accommodations. And there's other things as well that, that you may or may not need at some point. Um, uh, academic honesty is obviously a concern. I'll talk a bit about it in the context of the project. That's where it tends to come up uh, with plagiarism. And in terms of exams, uh, when we are closer to the final exam, I'll also I'll talk about it in terms of the final exam. But it's all things that I'm sure that you're, you're familiar with. Um, and this is just sort of standard boilerplate that you can read at your own leisure. Okay, uh, is there questions about any of that? Nope, okay, okay. So I'm gonna talk about the project. Uh, the other thing I'll note about the final exam is I don't choose when it is. So it's set by the university, so I have no control over it. Uh, since this is the winter term, a lot of uh, students wanna travel or do things uh, at the end of the term. So you cannot, like, you can't, like travel's not a valid excuse. Uh, for, for an exam. So you should consider the entire exam window, which is uh, April 20th to May 2nd, as potential dates for the final exam. So you should keep that uh, two weeks or whatever it is uh, free. Uh, don't book travel until after that or wait until the schedule comes out. Uh, schedule usually takes, I feel like I see it like end of February, start of March, maybe mid-February. I, I can't remember exactly when it comes out, but 
Uh, it well, it's not coming out like tomorrow or next week or anything like that. It, ta it takes a month or two, uh, but then it eventually will come out and it will be posted. Uh, the link uh, to where it's posted is here. And so obviously it's not here yet. They have the, but they have a schedule from last fall. Um, so you, if you've been here last term, you're familiar with that. Okay, uh, any other questions? Does that pique anyone's interest in anything? Okay, then uh, let me uh, turn gears to the projects. Okay, uh, so the project will be due the last day of class. Uh, the last day of class is kind of weird uh, because uh, we're on a Friday. Uh, Good Friday is a holiday, and so there's a makeup day for it. So basically, there'll be like the last week of classes, we'll have a class on Friday. Classes will end on Monday, and then Tuesday will be a makeup day for every other Friday class, essentially. So the, the last Tuesday of the term will be effectively a, a Friday. Um, so anyway, so that's when your project will be due. Um, I'm trying not to have an in-person lecture, so I have it penciled in that uh, I have a couple of videos you can watch, uh, and, and, and hopefully we don't have to have an in-person meeting on that last day, but we'll see as we get closer to it uh, if we can get through all the material in time. Um, usually it's not a problem. Um, so, so anyways, so that's that. Um, just some logistics. Uh, so I use a system called EAS. Uh, the link to it is here. Uh, it's just an upload system. It's pretty straightforward to use. You're going to use it for your assignments and you'll use it for the project. And the only thing it requires is an ENCS or Gina Cody uh, username and account. So you should have one by virtue of being students here. Uh, if you do not have one, uh, you can go to the AITS service desk. So there's one on the seventh floor of the EV building, and there's one here in Hall somewhere. I, I forget what floor it's on. Uh, but you can just go and show your student ID, and they'll give you the uh, username and password. So um, try and check it before the first assignments do. By the time the project comes around, you'll have used it twice already. Um, and uh, yeah, yeah, it's just an upload system. And then you'll get your marks back through AES as well for your, your two assignments. Uh, if you're not in engineering, if you're in another department, then you might not have that username and that's where you have to prioritize going in and making sure that you have it. Um, I believe you can access this from anywhere. I, I know that there was a big push this term to, to make it so that you need to use a VPN to access any ENCS resources. But I believe, as, as far as I know, that this you can still access without a VPN or, or if you're not on the university campus. Uh, if you have trouble with that, just shoot me an email so, so that I know that it's happening. Um, but I, 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 I accessed it from home yesterday and it seemed to work fine. Um, okay, so your project will be a written report. I want a PDF at the end. Uh, there's some stuff about how you name the file that you can go over when it, it's closer to being due. Um, and uh, if you work in a team, just one person can upload it. It doesn't matter who does it. Uh, everyone will receive uh, the same mark. Um, okay, so basically the report usually takes the format of one of two things. First off, it's very open-ended, so I don't really care what you do as long as it's interesting and it's relevant somehow to not just security, it can't just be a security project, but it has to have some focus on evaluation. So evaluation is like, how do you know that things are secure? Or what's the threat model for something? Or what are the assumptions that go into making it secure and those types of things? So uh, that doesn't have to be like 100% the focus, but it needs to be covered uh, in whatever you focus on. Um, and so some people will do kind of like a novel research topic and other people will try and summarize existing knowledge uh, on a particular paper. Um, so that's fine uh, and, and it has to have an element of evaluation. Uh, you can do it alone uh, or you can do it in two people, three people, four people. Uh, if you want to do more than four, that's fine. All these rules can be broken if you ask me. So if you come to me with a good reason for why you want to break one of the rules, then it's usually not a problem. But by default, uh, you can uh, work up to four. Uh, I do expect more the more people there are. Okay, so when I look at the report, I do one question I ask myself is, is this a suitable amount of work for two students or three students or four students? So if the project comes in, and it's a good project, but it's just as good as the kind of projects that I'm getting from a single student, 
and there's four students that worked on it, then uh, there, there'll be uh, deductions uh, based on that. Um, so it's meant to equalize you. Uh, it's not a disadvantage in any size. So pick your teams wisely, and you're not at a disadvantage working alone if you don't want to work with anyone or you don't know anyone, and you're not at a disadvantage for having a large team. It's I just try and normalize it uh, across it. Uh, the report should be no more than eight, eight pages. Once again, this is you can break this rule if you ask me, and I'm not going to count like if it's eight and a half or something like that. I don't, I don't care that much, but uh, I don't want 10 or 12 or 15 pages because then it just gets to be too much to read uh, for me. Um, also, this is a maximum, so you, you're welcome to, to, to write less if you want to. Uh, I don't care about template. Anything is fine. Default Word, default LaTeX, uh, it's fine. Uh, you don't have to have a cover page. Just have a title. Make sure that all the authors and their student numbers are listed right at the top of the first page and also in the file name, put the student numbers. Um, and then other than that, it, uh, it can be in any, temp any reasonable template. Um, okay, for, and then uh, plagiarism is, is uh, the issue of how you deal with the resources that you're uh, learning from. So I'm not expecting that you're experts and you're just going to write something off the top of your head. You're, of course, going to go and read other people's uh, things that they have written, and you're going to incorporate that knowledge into your own report, right? And so there's some rules about how to do that in a proper way. And so the basic rule is just you have to cite you have to give citation to the resources that you copied from. Um, and so let me uh, okay. Um, and so uh, usually my advice is first off, I'll, let's say what you cannot do: you cannot copy and paste text without assertion and present it as if it's your own. Uh, you cannot copy, paste, and text, and then change the grammar, so it's technically different text, uh, but the ideas are still being presented in the same order with the same logical flow. Okay, so that also is considered plagiarism, even if it's not word for word the same. Um, so it's not sufficient to even change the grammar. What you can do, though, is you can read it, you can internalize it, understand what it means, and then tell me in your own words what that person said, and tell me that you're telling me what that other person said, okay? So uh, you can do this in a very co conversational style. You don't have to do it in a formal way. So you can just be like, you know, this 2022 paper by Clark et al. You know, says that there's five properties of this, and these are the five properties, right? You just say it in a sentence, and then it's clear, okay, you didn't invent these five properties. They're from somewhere else, you know, and, and then there's no problem. Uh, you can't cite too much, so even if every sentence or every paragraph has a citation after it, that's fine, okay? So it's very common in the academic literature, especially when you're writing like more survey-ish uh, kinds of uh, papers that you have lots and lots of citations, like almost, you know, at least every paragraph and maybe even sentences within a paragraph you have a citation after. So it's, uh, it's not an indication that you're a weak student because you're relying on the knowledge of other people, okay? So it's it's a considered a benefit if you cite a lot. So when in doubt, just in, include uh, lots of citations. Um, yeah, so that's, that's that. Okay, uh, so here's a few tips uh, that I'll go through that, that uh, tend to make a, a project better. Um, so I'd like you to engage with the academic literature. So I'd like you to read some academic articles and have your topic and your project, you know, at least discuss uh, what's being discussed in academia as relevant. So maybe it's a super cutting edge topic and there aren't any papers on it, then it's fine. You can use Medium Post or HackMD or whatever resource that you want as long as it's credible. Uh, that, then that's, that's fine, okay? Now, what I don't want is, I don't want you to say, okay, here's three papers and I'm gonna write a survey about what they are. Or we have three team members, each one's gonna read a paper and we'll have two pages about each paper. What I want you to do instead is choose the topic. So start with the top, don't start with the papers, okay? Start with the topic and then to the extent that you need to use the papers to explain the topic, then you bring those papers in, okay? So I don't want a summary of other papers, okay? I want a project, a standalone, self-contained project on a particular topic, and you're pulling in knowledge from wherever you're, you're getting it from as suitable, okay? 
Um, so, so it's subtly different, uh, but we call these systemization of knowledge papers as opposed to a survey uh, paper. Um, so, so one way to help you understand the difference is you could pretend that I've read all the papers that you've cited, okay? So I've read them all. So I don't need a summary of what the papers are. What I'm interested in is what are your thoughts and how are you like, you know, taking what's in the papers, how are you explaining it, how are you maybe looking at things that the authors didn't focus on or maybe the authors are like, here's all the pros of the way I did things but they don't really list the cons or they're kind of buried. And so you're going in and saying, well, actually, this problem with the paper is a big problem. It's a much bigger problem than the authors um, make it out to be, uh, that type of thing. So uh, you can think critically also about the papers that you're reading. Uh, papers aren't always high quality. Um, so there's uh, lots of papers, especially if you're on Google Scholar, it will index anything that just looks like an academic paper. A lot of them are low quality papers. They might even be wrong, okay? So just because it's in a paper doesn't necessarily mean that it's right. Uh, one quick way to tell, or, or th that's sort of useful, but isn't, you can't keep it as like a closed rule, uh, but you can look at citations to a certain extent. Um, so papers that have like say 10 or more citations usually are, are good quality. If it has 100 or 500 or 1,000, then it's like a real landmark paper uh, in the area. If it doesn't have any citations, it might be because it's brand new, so that's pretty normal. But if it's a five-year-old paper and it has two citations and you click on them, and you realize that it's just the, the, one of the authors on the paper citing their own paper, then that's an indication that, that maybe it's not high quality. So it's not a, a, there's probably lots of exceptions to the rule, but it's one thing that Google Scholar shows you uh, that, that might let you do it. But anyway, the, the main point is to think critically uh, about what you're reading and don't just take it as correct just because it it's, looks like an academic paper. Um, so there's no requirements on how many papers. It's not like you have to have three papers or anything like that. So just as you need them, right? Start with the topic, start with the subject, uh, and then pull in papers as you need them. They don't have to be academic papers. Like I said, they can be any high quality. Uh, it could be a podcast. It could be a blog article, whatever. Um, but if you do choose a topic and there are relevant academic papers, you should address that, okay? So you shouldn't ignore the academic papers. So uh, the only reason that you wouldn't have the academic papers in your report is because there aren't any, not because you chose not to, to, to engage with them. Um, so this I covered. You can be skeptical about what other people have, have written. Authors are kind of like salespersons, so they try and pitch you, right? They want to make it sound good, so they're going to give you all the high points, and they're going to minimize the low points. Uh, and so your job is to go in and think, be even-handed uh, when you look at these papers and, and think about them. Um, it, to get you started with the kinds of topics that you might look at is a good place is just to look at other academic papers. Um, so these are the four biggest venues in security, the most important venues. Uh, each of them run once a year. And so uh, the, you can look at the most recent proceedings uh, from all four of them. And that would be like a thousand papers probably or more. I think CCS itself has like 400 or something. Um, so anyways, you, it's about a thousand papers a year across these four conferences. And then, you know, papers even five years isn't that old. That's pretty recent, you know, for security or whatever. So, so there's thousands of papers there. Um, the idea would be like just look at titles, just skim them and look for a topic that looks interesting, right? And if it's interesting, click on it. Every paper has an abstract, which is like a one paragraph summary. Read the abstract. Maybe it's not so interesting now that you've read the abstract and you keep going, or maybe it's interesting and then you take a look at the paper itself, okay? Uh, once you find a kind of topic and maybe you find a couple papers, uh, you can look at the related work in the paper itself. So every paper has a section called related work and it will tell you the other papers that were published on the same topic. Okay, so that's how you could find other topics. Or maybe the paper is interesting, but it's not exactly what you're interested in. Then the related work might find another paper that, that is more precisely what you're interested in. Now, of course, related work can only cover papers published before it, right? So if the paper you're looking at is from 2020, it's going to have papers from 2019 and before. It's not going to have a paper from 21, 22. Um, and so then you can use Google Scholar and you can look at see which papers have cited it 
and then that will tell you what papers are including it in their related work. Uh, so you can find the forward papers, the papers forward in time uh, from Google Scholar, and you can find the papers backwards in time from the paper itself. Okay, and so anyways, it shouldn't be hard. Once you have that one kind of paper in the area, it's not that hard to move kind of laterally around and, and, and find other uh, papers that are related. Uh, yeah, and, and you can, uh, you don't have to like, these also aren't necessarily about methodology, right? But I think any topic that you choose, you can just then look at the methodology of, of how you would consider it to be secure. Okay, in terms of uh, choosing your topic, uh, you, there's no like authorization. You don't, I don't have to approve it or anything like that. In fact, we have to have zero interaction at all. Uh, if you just submit the PDF on the final day that it's due, then that's fine. We don't have to ever talk. Um, but at the same time, I am here to help. So I, I like to hear about what you're thinking uh, or that type of thing. So if you wanna run your project idea by me, that's fine. You can do it by email or after class or whatever. Uh, if you want some help with it or if you have questions about it, uh, you can ask. Um, the one thing I won't do is I won't read a draft of your project uh, just because it's too much for it to read every student's uh, draft. It's, it's enough work to just read the final paper. So uh, what I might do is give you a time bucket of two minutes where I'll look through it and skim it and tell you whatever I can, you know, looking at it for two minutes, but I, I can't, uh, I can't like do an actual read through of it. Uh, it's possible that because there's no like approval, it's different people might work on the same topic. So that happens every year. There's, there's a couple different uh, topics. I wouldn't worry about that if you hear of other people that are doing the same topics. Usually, you know, any topic, most topics are extremely broad, right? And one thing I'll do is if, if you come to me with your topics, I'm, I'll always tell you the same thing. Try and narrow it, make it narrower, make it narrower, okay? You can't do like, what's the security of iPhone versus Android? Like it's too broad. Like there's so many different aspects that go in. You know, look at the kernel. How is the kernel different? Look at the permissions. How are the permission systems different? Like, you know, pick something very, very narrow uh, to, to, to compare. Um, by the way, you can't do those projects now that I, I offer them as a suggestion. Um, but anyways, just try and keep it narrowing it down. It's better to do a deeper dive on a narrow topic than try and do something that's uh, too broad. It's also, you'll, you'll have less papers to deal with, right? Like all the p papers on Android security are hundreds. Right, and so you you know you need to you need to keep narrowing things down. Um, so anyway, so it's hard once everyone narrows down sufficiently. Probably there's not going to be a lot of collisions in terms of topics. There may be two people that are looking at the same general area, but they're looking at a different sub sub question. But anyways, even if it was the exact same narrow topic, then that's fine. Then it's just there's two projects on it. <clears throat> okay, the last thing uh, is is advice. Uh, you don't have to do this, but I find it. Sometimes it helps or it helps uh, with some students that, that are struggling with their project topic uh, is to, to phrase your project topic as a question, right? Uh, and if it's a question, then it becomes obvious what should be included in the report. It's whatever helps answer that question, okay? So it's just the answer to the question. If you're telling me all sorts of details about something that isn't answering the question, uh, then, then that stuff shouldn't be included. Um, so, so anyways, that, that's one way to like kind of narrow uh, your project. Um, you should struggle a bit choosing a good project topic. I think that's like part of this whole project thing is like maybe 10, 20% of, of, of your mark, not necessarily your mark, but like of the work that goes into the project is actually selecting a good topic, right? So selecting, good, if you're struggling, that's normal, okay? Uh, it's okay to struggle with the topic that's that's like part of it is, is getting a good project topic. And if you can find a good one, uh, then it will make the project a lot easier, right? It'll just be a lot clearer what you're doing. It'll be a lot, you, you can go out and search and find resources because you have a precise topic. You can you know, go out and find things a lot easier. You're not reading all sorts of stuff that are kind of generally about what you're doing, but end up not, you end up not using. Uh, it just lets you focus and then it's probably quicker to, to pump out the actual uh, report itself. So anyways, yeah. Uh, references, I don't care about format. As long as I can read and figure out what you're referring to, it doesn't matter uh, how you, like the, there's a whole bunch of different for, proper formats or whatever. You don't have to follow any of those. Um, 
And security is very broad. So there's lots of different things that, like there's a, you can take a security perspective on all sorts of different things, right? It can be software, it can be hardware. In this course, we'll look at everything from airports to like how humans use systems to phishing emails, you know, like whatever. Like, so it can be about physical security. It can be, it can be about anything, right? Um, so don't feel that you have to write, you know, some sort of, I don't know, static analysis of code paper or like network analysis, pen testing or something like that. Like it doesn't have to be like in that box of what we traditionally think about of security. In fact, I would encourage you to try and think more broadly. And you'll see that, that that's a lot of the things that are in this course. So uh, our curriculum here is when you take 6110, 120, 130, 140, they give you all the like kind of standard sort of security topics, like the core kind of security topics, the boring ones. Um, and uh, what I try and do in this course is I try and pick up all the things that, that are sort of missed across the four of them. Or in some cases, we'll look at it from a different perspective. Um, so, so there'll be some overlap, like later we'll talk about um, cross-site scripting attacks, but we don't care about the attack itself. It's not like, oh, this is a cool attack, like how do we categorize it, how do we defend against it? It's sort of like, why does this attack work anyways, right? Like what? what went wrong in designing the policy of the browser that led to this being a hole uh, that people could exploit. So that's more like the perspective that we'll take. So anyways, we're always trying to look at things from, from different perspectives in, in this. Um, uh, there's a grading scheme. This is for the project itself. Um, so a lot of the marks are just sort of on what's the topic? Does it make sense? Uh, everything that you included or didn't include in the report, does that make sense? Is there a flow through it? If you're answering a question, does everything like lead up to the answer of the question? Uh, all that type of stuff. So that's sort of what I call scope and execution. It's just about like uh, that. Uh, interpretation is basically me trying to assess whether you understand the topic or not. So it is possible, believe it or not, to write about something in your own words and not understand it. So you can read something and you can pare it back the details of it, you can do it in your own words, but you really don't understand it, right? Um, and so what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to assess whether you understand it or not. Uh, it's hard to say how I do it. It's just, I guess I've read in so many of these things that I, I sort of know, but like a lot of it's like the way you explain it. Like if, if you miss things or there's gaps or there's missing steps, that's like an indication that maybe you didn't understand it. Uh, if you go into a lot of nitty gritty detail on one little part of it and then completely gloss over other parts, like it's sort of uneven in terms of its explanation. Um, on the other hand, if you're explaining things well, if you're using analogies, if you're sort of uh, explaining in ways that, that you know, um, that you wouldn't get from an academic paper because an academic paper is written at like kind of a more scientific quality level, right? And so actually like, kind of dumbing the writing down a bit is actually an indication that, that you understand it, right? Like explaining it more like you would do in a blog post uh, as opposed to an academic writing, that's, that's actually hard to do. That's a hard skill to do because you have to translate down all the technical details and focus on what's important. So anyway, so that's, that's that part. Uh, technicality is just, this is a graduate course, so I expect something that has some level of technical detail. What this means will differ. So if you're doing crypto, if you're doing security, if you're doing software, network, you know, whatever, human security, uh, it's, it's going, what that looks like is different. But the main thing is you don't shy away from the details. So when it's time to get technical and you have to explain like the finer grain details of the project, you don't just sort of gloss over it. You, you're not scared or put off by it, you, you go through. Now, the one thing I didn't mention is it's perfectly acceptable to actually not understand something. Right? So maybe you're doing like some crypto protocols and there's a bunch of math and you know, it takes five years in a PhD to understand it. Right? I don't expect you to understand it. That's fine, just say it in the report. Right? So you can say, oh, they use this blind signature scheme. I don't really understand the math, but like, this is what it does, supposedly. This is what the authors assert that it does. And if we take it as truth that this is actually what it does, this is why it's useful. Uh, for whatever we're looking at, okay? So it's fine to draw black boxes around things and say, I don't really understand how the details work inside. So just tell me that, tell me that in the report that, you know, I didn't really get this concept, but you know, I know why it's important and uh, you can focus on how you use things and not necessarily how they work on the inside. 
Um, and then the last marks are for presentation, which usually isn't a problem. Most people get, you know, 10 out of 10 on this or 9 out of 10. Uh, but it's basically like, um, it just, you know, it's, it's, I don't care about grammar and, and all those types of things. If English isn't your first language and you're making grammatical mistakes and things like that, I don't, I don't really care about that. You're not going to lose marks for that. Uh, but the logic and the flow should be there. Uh, I should understand uh, what it is. If you could use a figure to describe something, you should use a figure or a table or whatever that deliverable is that would help understand. If you have a bunch of figures that are needless, then that's an indication that it's not appropriate. Um, you shouldn't just copy and paste figures out of, web, of other papers. You should redraw them because then you can put the emphasis on what it is you want to communicate, not what it is that the authors wanted to communicate. Um, you should use citations appropriately. Uh, and anyways, the, all that type of stuff. Um, and then uh, the main deduction that I look at that doesn't, I won't fit into one of these categories is sort of the amount of work that went into it. So if it's a group of four and it looks like a group of one, I won't take marks off necessarily from one of these categories. It will just be a sort of general uh, deduction. Okay. Uh, questions about the projects? Okay. All right, good. Um, so anyways, if these, as you start working on it, uh, if you have further questions later, uh, you, can, you can raise them later. Okay, uh, any, any last questions? Everyone, is everyone just too shy? Is it, one person's gonna ask a question and then everyone will? Um, is there any questions before we get into the course material itself about any of the logistics? You can use Overleaf to write. Use Overleaf to write the paper? Yeah, yeah. So Overleaf, if you want to use LaTeX, uh, Overleaf is a website, uh, so you don't have to have an editor for it. And uh, it has a nice default, it has some default templates. So you might use Lecture Notes in Computer Science. That's one that I know that is a template for it. If you've never used LaTeX before, it, there is a learning curve with it. Um, I don't know that if you, I, I don't know, like, anyways, I don't, I don't know if it, it's not worth it if you're, or if you're going to use it for this project and never use it again, it's not worth learning because um, it's, it's complicated. But if you're going to do lots of course projects and if you're, especially if you're in like a thesis based program, uh, then you absolutely have to learn it. Um, and yeah, it, it just like, um, it makes citations a lot easier. That's the main benefit and math. So those are the two things that does well. If you're using Word, it's a real pain to do citations and manage them and then you change one citation and then everything else changes and things like that. There are some like plugins, I guess, for Word that, that try and help you, but LaTeX is very clean. You just, you go to the website, you find the, the paper that you wanna cite. It gives you the LaTeX like file with all the information. You just put plop that into your paper um, and then you, you just, you give it a name, like a tag and then you just say cite it. And then LaTeX will figure out, am I doing it alphabetically? Am I doing it by year, by citation? You know, whatever, it just automatically does everything. Um, and then for math too, it's, it's a lot cleaner. You do have to learn the syntax for inputting math. And I, I don't know if Overleaf has like equation editors and things like that. Um, but, but anyways, it, uh, it, it's, it's a lot cleaner uh, for, for doing math. It's a lot less like plugging and poking around with like the cursor and like selecting things that you want. So if you have a lot of math, a lot of citations, uh, LaTeX is good. It might save you time in the long run. And uh, yeah, that's, that's my plug for LaTeX. And so Overleaf is a really nice, and also if you're, if you're working in a group, uh, you can also collaborate like sort of like Google Docs. Uh, you can have a shared uh, Overleaf uh, where multiple people can be editing at the same time. Other questions or comments? Yep. So your colleague in the field should be uh, related, related to some sort of technique. Uh, for example, I have some uh, idea about uh, the uh, social engineering or something like this. Uh, sure. So for the topic, it's it's much broader than that. It it's really wide open. So the main question of the course, which will the first thing I'll write down, is, um, you know, the main thing is like how do you determine that something's secure, right? Like I hand you something and I ask you, is it secure? 
that's what methodology is. So what's the methodology you use? What, what does it even mean to be secure? So what is the definition? And secure against what or from whom? So that's kind of threat modeling. And then how do you, like, I'm convinced it's secure. How do I convince you? Like, what's that deliverable? Like, how do I deliver it uh, to you? And so that's methodology, right? And so uh, you can take that and you can apply it to any domain, right? So it can be about, I don't know, like last year, it could be about like a smart car or a smart home, or it could be about a network protocol or 5G or WPA3, or it could be about some crypto thing. It could be about, I don't know, voting. It could be about finance or banking, you know, whatever, whatever you want. And um, yeah, and, and, and so you can, you can also consider privacy too. So privacy is sort of in, integrated with security. Uh, and so you can think about privacy considerations also across different domains. And so I suggest something, if you have like personal interests like outside of security, think about what those interests are and, and is there actually a security consideration with any of them, right? Um, like if you're into, I don't know, music or sports or whatever, like, like there's all these like fitness devices, they have privacy considerations, right? You're streaming music, that has, there's some security with that. There's, you know, copyright issues, there's, um, there's privacy issues you know, um, pretty much anything that you can think of, there is some aspect of security or privacy to it uh, that, that you can consider. Okay, other questions? Okay. All right, so as I just mentioned, the goal of the course And, and just to reiterate, you will get a PDF. So you'll have a copy of this PDF on, on Moodle and you'll have a video of me, like everything that you see that happening on the screen as well. So uh, you can take notes or not take notes. It doesn't matter, whatever. Okay, so you get a new job, congratulations. You're now a security person. Uh, you're working somewhere and you show up on the first day and they hand you something, uh, we'll call it X, and they say, is it secure? Okay, you're the security person, so it's your job to say yes or no and why, all right? And so how do you go about that, all right? That's, that's methodology, okay? So methodology is basically what do you do, or evaluation, security evaluation methodology, but I'll just shorten it to methodology, is basically What do you do? How do you start? Okay. And so this is going to be a complicated question. Um, and one of the messages, main message of the course is, there's no one methodology that I can teach you. And once you know this methodology, then, then you're set. You know, it doesn't matter what you're handed, you can always answer the question of whether it's secure or not. Okay, so it, security absolutely does not work that way. So probably the, the main consideration that, that makes it so complicated is the number of different kinds of things that you could be handed are just, there's too many different things, right? So you could be handed a piece of software that might be a pretty standard thing. But even within software, it might be an operating system, it might be a database, might be an application. And so how you would approach a database, you know, are you worried about, I don't know, SQL injection attacks, right? Like that's, rel that's something that's relevant to databases, but it has nothing to do with operating systems, right? And so, you know, each of these would be like its own domain, right? And that's just within software, but you're not just necessarily given software, right? You could be given, I don't know, hardware. Uh, you could be giving some sort of like network device, which is kind of, you we can, these aren't meant to be like absolutely like, like there's a clear difference between hardware and network, like they're, they're kind of the same. So network would be like, I don't know, like router kind of thing, gateway, firewall, it might be software, it might be hardware. Hmm. 
middle boxes, that kind of stuff. Hardware could be like tokens, some sort of like RFID kind of thing. Internet of Things, some smart device. Okay, what are other things besides software, hardware, and network? Does that cover everything? What other courses do you take? Okay, protocols. Uh, so 6110 would be like protocols or 6120. Okay, so it might be like some sort of cryptographic thing. Could be a network protocol. Uh, AI security's hot now. I work on something called blockchain, which is also pretty hot. So that kind of stuff. All right, so you say take 6110, 6120, that's protocols. You take 30, 30 operating systems, and then 40s networking. Uh, we don't really have a hardware one. There's other courses. So we have things on cyber physical systems. Okay, so cyber physical. So what are cyber physical systems? What's an example of a cyber physical? So smart grid. So some sort of hydro thing, um, like I don't, I'm not an expert, but I think like things like vehicles, drones, like that kind of stuff falls under this. Self-driving cars, that kind of thing. Um, data itself is sort of it more on privacy than security. Um, you can think of it as maybe it falls into the software of the database, but some, some technology is about the data itself. Like, are you anonymizing the data before you release it? Well, what does that look like? Now, maybe that's a protocol, um, but you can think about privacy, security from breaches, that kind of thing. Okay, what else? Okay, what about social engineering? What's that the security of? Humans, okay. So they don't have to be machines or hardware or software. We can think about the security of humans. Uh, we'll consider something called usability as well. So that'll be another focus of the course. Um, policies is another thing that we'll focus on. So policies would be more like, say a corporation or something like that. Uh, like say Concordia, it's a university, has lots of security policies. The fact that I had to use 2FA to log into Moodle, somebody decided that I had to do that. That's a policy. They did it because they want to increase security. Um, and so that was a security policy. Is it a good policy or a bad policy? Well, that's, that's, what, that's the kind of thing that you might be handed and asked, okay, should, should we be moving to multi-factor authentication, yes or no? So procedures, um, sometimes you look at things like, like sometimes there's projects on voting, that's something I looked at. So that's like a very, uh, there's a lot of procedures that you go through that are meant to add security. Or if you look at like gambling or like, like say you go to Vegas and you use a video lottery machine. There's a bunch of procedures that went into making sure that that machine is fair and that it can't be tampered with and uh, that the software that's running can't be hacked and things like that. Um, so there's special use cases where we, we tend to use procedures rather than, sometimes it's a mix. There's some hardware security, there's some tamper seals and those kinds of things, but there's also a lot of procedures that go in, right? Or uh, organizations are like, a, like who's allowed to 
issue a digital signature on something that's important. Well, you have three different people and they all have like a hardware security module in their, in their safety deposit box and they all come together into the single room and, and that type of thing. Um, so hardware, uh, we, there's physical security, which is sort of related to hardware. Sometimes, maybe I'll, I'll write it out separately. I did last year. So this would be like all your traditional security thing, locks, safes, those safety deposit box, uh, that kind of stuff. Uh, so it's not necessarily different. So this this is just meant as sort of rough notes. It's not, I'm not necessarily saying that, yeah, these things are different. You can also argue that data sort of belongs either in this category or this category. But anyways, point is that if someone hands you a lock or someone hands you a smart self-driving car or someone hands you a cryptographic protocol for a digital signature and asks you, is it secure, right? The way you go about that is probably going to be very different, right, for each of those cases. Okay, and so the point is that it, uh, it's hard in a course like this. Actually, my job is hard because I can't give you one methodology that's going to work for all of this stuff, right? And we don't have time to look at each individual case, okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick and choose a bit things that I think are interesting uh, that we'll look at. Um, and so, and I'll, I'll, like I said, I'll try and tend, I'll tend to focus on things that aren't well covered. So there's core courses on like sort of software network protocols. There's a course on cyber physical. Um, I don't think anyone else talks about policies. I don't think other people talk about social engineering or usability. Um, uh, we'll, we'll look at protocols a bit as well, but sort of from a different lens. And so uh, anyway, so this it's sort of a bunch of collection of, of topics that don't really fit well in the other, uh, in the other courses. Okay, so these are the reasons why a course like this is hard just to lower your expectations. So there's no single methodology that's going to work for all of these. Or it's going to do a good job with all of them. So the first methodology I'll show you is called STRIDE, and it actually does pretty much work for all of them. You could apply STRIDE to any of these things. The problem with it is it's so high level, right, that it's not, it's like, it, it gets the conversation started about like what's secure. It, it's good for brainstorming some stuff, but it's not going to really answer the question that you have of like, like is a signature secure or not? Right, like it, it's not capable of that, okay? So it's more like you have some high level methodologies that do work for lots of different things, but they don't give you a lot of depth, right? And then you have some deep methodologies that can really answer questions like, I don't know, static analysis, dynamic analysis on a piece of software or something like that. That can give you real concrete answers, but it works on software, it doesn't work on anything else, okay? Um, so that, anyway, that's how methodologies tend to work. They're either, they're widely applicable, but they're not very deep, or they're very deep, and then they're not widely applicable. So you don't have one that's both. So I should say that works for everything and produces non-trivial results. Okay, the second thing that makes this hard is you, it's hard to tell, like security is usually not the first thing that you consider. Like say you're doing a social network, right? First off, you wanna have the idea, figure out how it works and all of that. Then you have to build it and get it functional, like just have it work, right? Then maybe you think about security, right? And then maybe you think about what are the vulnerabilities of it and you know how can I secure it, okay? So until you really understand what you're doing and the domain, uh, it's hard to think about security. So if I know nothing about a car, right, I'm not going to be able to tell you about the security of, of an autonomous vehicle if I know nothing about it, right? Uh, even if I'm a security expert, right? Um, and so security comes with 
uh, it comes with some domain expertise. Okay, so you can't you can't be a security expert and only a security expert. You have to also be an expert in what you're applying to it. Okay, so that's another reason why we can't blow through the methodology for everything because you would have to become an expert, and I'm not even an expert in everything, right? Um, and so I so anyways, um, so you have to understand the domain before you think about security. Okay, the third point is that uh, methodology it doesn't actually prove that something's secure. What it proves is something that is not vulnerable to a bunch of security things that you know about, okay? So that's a little different than saying it's secure, right? It's just like, there's 10 things that I know that would make this insecure, and it's secure against those 10 things, okay? That doesn't mean that somebody's going to dream up an 11th thing that you never thought of, right? And it's going to be secure against that, okay? So at the end of the day, you could actually never really say that things are secure. You can just say that of all the insecurities I know about, all the vulnerabilities, I, I at least check those, and I know that it's, it seems anyways uh, not to, to, to be secure against them. Okay, so this is going to be worded kind of weird because it's a double negative, but instead of saying it's secure, we're saying it's not, not insecure. Against known attacks. Now that doesn't mean that you just give up, right? And you don't, you don't check. You say, well, I'll never know whether this is secure or not. So I'm not even gonna check it. No, like you still have to do, you have to check it against the known vulnerabilities, right? So this is a necessary but not sufficient condition for being, in terms of being secure. So it's still necessary, even if it's not sufficient. It's also good news for anyone who wants to work in this field because there's always new attacks and new things to consider and you, you can never be sure that something's secure ever and so you don't, you kind of never run out of work um, because of this. Okay, so methodologies, we could start by splitting them into um, high versus low level methodologies. So something that's high level will be widely applicable, but it won't give you a lot of detail. So we're going to start by looking at three of these sort of high level things and then uh, we'll go lower level later, but only on selected topics. So we'll look at something called stride today. Uh, we'll look at something called evaluation frameworks. And we'll look at something called attack trees. The 
evaluation frameworks will look at uh, an example based on passwords and attack trees will actually spend a lot of time. So this is one where I'm going to teach you the domain knowledge. So I'm going to show you, okay, here's all the domain knowledge and then we're going to put it into an attack tree. So it's going to take like three lectures to go through, um, but it will be a very detailed uh, explanation. So you can see how, sort of how deep you can go even if they're high level methodologies. And then low level is basically the opposite. Um, so it's very narrow in what you can apply it to. So it only works with software or not just like it works with software, but it works with software where you know the source code of the software and the source code is like written in a language that's type safe and you can generate a control flow graph of it or whatever. Like, so it's, it's not even that general. And then, okay, you can use this exact tool or whatever to try and look. And then it's not even going to tell you the code's secure, it's just going to tell you, well, there's these 15 bugs that we know about and it doesn't seem like you have any of them. Anyways, uh, so that's like a low level uh, methodology. So it's narrow in applicability. Um, but it gives you, it gives you a lot of depth. It can, anyways. So for your project topics, you can look at specific. You can look at methodologies themselves, right? So you can that could be the project, but you can also pick something that you want to know the security about, right? And then in that case, you would be saying which methodology is appropriate, right? Or when people go around saying that this is secure, it's not even like what you think, it's like what are, what's everyone saying, right? So people are saying this thing is secure, well, what was the methodology that they used to, to conclude that? And is, was that appropriate? Could it be better? Could it be worse? Um, that's, that's the kind of thing. So we'll, uh, anyways, we, we won't go through a lot, that, so many low level ones because uh, because they're so narrow, they only apply to like specific domains. Uh, but you will see these in other courses that you take. So you'll see tools for software or, or network or that type of thing. Okay, so high level is, back going back to high level, uh, it's sort of useful for brainstorming. Brainstorming means like just sort of coming up with an initial list of ideas of things, but it's not necessarily going to be very deep uh, in terms of it. And it's good for organizing as well. Like if you want to present to a client your security assessment, you can use these high level methodologies to, to, to organize them and give them a deliverable that, that's easier for them to consume as well. Okay, uh, so the first thing, one that we'll talk about is called Stride. And uh, I'm actually looking at the time now. It might, before we get into this, maybe it's a good time to take a break. So I, we usually take a 10 minute break in the middle because it's a long time to sit. So why don't you go away for 10 minutes or chat or whatever and uh, we'll come back around five after seven. <laughs> All right, everyone, we'll get started again.
All right. Okay, so we're going to talk about stride. Uh, very, very sort of simple approach. Uh, so this is a high level methodology. Comes from Microsoft Research. Uh, it's meant to be used on a single security solution. Uh, as opposed to an evaluation framework, which we'll talk about next, which is about comparing uh, alternative solutions. So it, um, I'll call it a target, basically. The X that you're trying to evaluate. It tries to look at all attacks on that X. Yeah? Um, uh, an evaluation framework is like, here's 10 different X's you might use, which one should you use? An attack tree is like, here's one attack on one system, what are all the different ways you can do it? So they're slightly different, uh, but they're, they're all like, have this sort of high levelness in common. Okay, so this is an extension to an old, like the first thing that you generally would learn in a security course, uh, which is called the CIA model. Does anyone know what this is besides the intelligence agency? Okay, all right, so it's fairly well known. Uh, so confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Okay, so the main observation of Stride is just that, that these three are good, uh, but there's probably more attacks, or there's some other attacks that don't really fit well into these three categories. Some people extended CIA, so sometimes you see CIAA or CIAA. So usually authentication and authorization are two of the things that are added. So Stride's the same idea, it's just it has six things instead of uh, three of them, including these three. Now. These are the property that you want. So confidentiality is the thing that you want. Stride just flips the wording around so that it's the thing that you don't want. Um, so uh, we'll go through them. So, but just at a high level, Stride is spoofing, tampering, repudiation, information disclosure, denial of service, and escalation of, of privileges. So, um, so confidentiality from CIA is here, it's just flipped around. So the opposite of confidentiality is that you're disclosing information that you shouldn't. So that's what the I is. And integrity, the opposite of it is tampering. And um, uh, availability is flipped into denial of service. I forgot which A was the canonical A. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah, so I don't mean it like at that level where you have to break your system down into modules. You can actually do it at any level you want, but the point is you're not, it's not a comparison between 10 different systems. So it's, that's what I mean. It's not like you're like, uh, here's 10 systems I could use, which one's the most secure, right? So that's what an evaluation framework will give you. This is more like an analysis of one system, but it doesn't matter if that system is made up of lots of little subparts or if it's just one cohesive thing that doesn't matter so much. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, good. Um, okay, so spoofing is the opposite of authentication. Uh, so this is impersonating someone or something. Um, so like in social engineering, for example, the, we think of spoofing at a human level, uh, but spoofing doesn't have to be at a human level. It can also be at a software level. So uh, it could also be a cryptographic level. We'll talk about certificates uh, so in, when we go through HTTPS, we'll talk about website spoofing, uh, where you pretend to be some website that you're not. Um, and so anyway, you, you hear this term, it's not always humans or software, it, it could be different things. It could be different libraries. Um, a, a common thing that's, that we see now are uh, what are called time of check versus time of use vulnerabilities. So this is related to spoofing. I'll just add it as a note.
so time of use. Time to check. So this usually happens in software. It could happen in procedures, policies. Uh, basically, you know, in terms of security, you, you're often checking things. So like spoofing is like you're checking the identity. Like, is this the right person? Are they who they say they are? Do they have the credentials or the privileges to do the tasks that they want to do? Uh, and then if the answer is yes, then you let them use the system. Um, but the vulnerability is how do you know that the same person that's going to use the system is the same person that you just checked, right? And so like a really kind of dumb example of it would be like pretend you, I don't know, you're going to the club with your friends and you have to be over 18 and so i get your id i'm the bouncer and i look at it you know i check the birth date on your id so yes you are over 18 and then i look at the picture i look at your face right and now i know that it's you that's there right and then i look back to the card as i hand it to you now imagine you can't do this in real life but imagine if your friend who's underage jumped in and grabbed the card out of my hand instead of you right then I would be like, okay, go into the club, and then they would walk into the club, okay? Maybe a more realistic example would be like, if the bouncer gives us bracelets and said that, has, that person has been checked, and then they just exchange bracelets. Yeah, that too, yeah. So they could slip the bracelet to someone else, or, or someone else could put their hand in it when they put it on or something like that, but yeah. But anyways, the point is, this wouldn't happen in real life, right? Like your friend can't jump in without the bouncer noticing, unless if you're like an illusionist or something like that, right? But is that true of computers? It's absolutely not, right? A computer can, can switch things. There's a file, you check the file, and then you're about to load the library because you just checked it. It could get swapped out, right? Your program can get suspended. The operating system goes off and does something else. A Couple milliseconds later, you're back in control, and guess what, that file's different. It's not the same file, right? You didn't lock it, um, and someone swapped out that file with a, with a different file. But you already did your check, and now you're about to authorize it. And so, but then do you check again? Well, then you'll just check forever, right? So you need to, you need to somehow lock things, do your check, do the thing that you want to do, and then release it, right? And so anyway, so that, that's one example of like sort of a more advanced version of spoofing. So these, these things, you can go a little deeper than, than this. But anyways, and then tampering is the opposite of integrity. So this is like modifying something. So it could be data, it could be code, it could be a file, um, could be packets as they go across the, the network. Uh, repudiation's kind of a weird one that doesn't really fit into CIA, uh, even with all the extensions. Um, repudiation, basically, it has to do with accountability. So let's say that you did do something, you accessed the file, right? Do I know that you accessed the file? Is there a log of it? What if you say, oh, I never accessed that file? Right? Uh, what if you buy something on Amazon and then you write to Amazon and say it never showed up? Right? Then how does Amazon know whether it showed up or not? Right? Uh, so that, that would be repudiation. So let's say you actually received the packet, uh, but you want your money back, so you claim, oh, I, it never signed up. And Amazon would be like, okay, you know what? You've never complained about anything in the past. And I see you've spent hundreds of dollars or thousands of dollars with us. So you know what? We'll, we'll believe you, right? And so, and that's fine. So you get away with it the first time, but then you're like, oh, this is awesome. And then you order a whole bunch of stuff and say it doesn't show up. And then they flag your account because you do it too much, right? Um, so that's sort of how you would deal with it, right? So sometimes you just accept a certain base rate of fraud. Um, other times you, you, know, you, you have a lot of logs, secure logs and things like that, but then of course you can always go in and tamper with the logs themselves, right? And so anyway, so this is a whole set of security. There's a bunch of security around. Uh, people who do something, how do you prove that they actually did it and what if they claim that they didn't do what they actually did? Uh, information disclosure uh, is the opposite of confidentiality. So you have secrets, you want your secrets to kept, be kept secret um, and so uh, if it's not the case, if there's a breach and the information leaks, uh, then that's a breach of, of information disclosure. Uh, denial of service is uh, you want things that are available. So network denial of service is, is the most obvious example that we usually think about. Um, so that's where you have a website, you wanna keep it running. Uh, you don't want someone to bring it down. Um, but there's other denials of service as well, right? So uh, even with software, you could like, 
I don't know, get the software doing something forever so it just hangs, right, as a, as a way of crashing the software. Um, you can, sometimes you just want to delay things. You don't necessarily want to stop it forever, but if you can delay it long enough, then maybe something changes after a couple of days. It could be a policy or procedure. You're just trying to drag something out, right? And if you can drag it out long enough, then the rules change uh, in terms of how it's handled. Um, so that's denial of service. In terms of network denial of service, I'll just uh, give you another sort of antidote. So traditionally, the way denial of service works is you have a website, you want to take it down. And so this is like back when I was a kid. I would be here and the website would be here. And I just want to spam the website with as much bandwidth as I can, right? So I, I send it pings or whatever. And uh, I just hit it as hard as I can, right? And then uh, eventually, you know, if I, if I hit it hard enough, then the website would go down and that worked for a while. Then websites realize, okay, we need, we need to just have more, we need to have a bigger pipe than the attacker. If we have a bigger pipe than the attacker, then that's fine, right? And so now we have web hosting solutions and Cloudflare and all that kind of stuff. And so this basically isn't possible anymore. Um, so then people switch to distributed denial of service, right? And so now it's like, well, I'm gonna hit you, but I'm gonna get all my friends to do it too at the same time. And maybe my friends are a botnet that I rented so I went on the dark web and I bought access to a bunch of computers that have malware on it. I have 10,000 of them. I have them for one hour. I can do whatever I want with them for one hour. And then, uh, you know, I get them all to just hammer this website with traffic. Okay. Um, so this is uh, DDoS, distributed denial service. Now, what we're seeing today is even different yet. Uh, we are seeing what are called amplification attacks. So the way this works is you, first off, you find something that uh, runs over what's called UDP. So this is an alternative to TCP. Okay, so almost everything on the web runs over TCP. So that's a protocol that basically, like say you go to a website and you download it, the way you talk to the web server is with TCP. And basically TCP says, uh, you wanna receive every packet that the server sent, okay? So somehow you're gonna be confirming, uh, every packet will have an order, it will have a number, and if I get the packets maybe out of order just because the way networking works. So I'm going to reorder them. And if I'm missing a packet in the middle, then I'll, I'm going to ask the server again. I'm going to say, I didn't get packet number 49. Can you send it again? And the server will send it. Okay. So everything is nice and orderly, but there's a delay that's involved. There's a latency that's involved in that system. Okay. The other thing we do with TCP is we do what's called a handshake. So I say hi to the server and the server says hi back. And then we start sending data uh, back and forth. Now, sometimes you don't want that overhead. You don't want the overhead of the handshake. And sometimes you don't care if packets get lost, right? Say you're streaming something on Netflix and you realize that a couple frames are being dropped. Well, by the time you re-ask for them, the video's already kind of moved on from that point anyways, right? So it's better just to, you know, it goes blurry for a second and then it goes back into proper resolution. That's, that's a better than, you know, asking for the packets and, and trying to get them back, okay? So that might be an example of something that runs over UDP. Uh, if you're doing something very frequently, like a DNS request, like I'm going to google.com, what's the IP address of google.com so I can route my packet? You ask your DNS server, you don't wanna do a three-way handshake and then ask, okay? So you just send it and they send it back. Um, so UDP, there's no handshake. no packet recovery, that kind of stuff. I'll say guarantee. It's basically simpler and faster, okay? So for denial of service, what you do is you go out and you find something that uses UDP, yeah. So for TCP, do you take advantage of all the limitations of the packet for being and by specifically, specifically dropping some packets that the server needs to 
Yeah, so possibly. So usually you, um, when you're doing DDoS, you, you, first off, you, you tend to not complete the handshake. Like you hit them with the hello as hard as you can. And because if you, if you have to do that whole round trip, then it's kind of like you have to send twice as many packets for its one reply packet. So for what the kinds of things that you want to do, like dropping packets in the middle, you'd have to first do the complete handshake then you would start your sort of attack. And so it's kind of like too much overhead for the attack, if that makes sense. Yeah. And so the ratio between how much information am I sending versus how much does it have to send back or like respond, that, that's important to it. Yeah. And that actually is, is exactly what happens with amplification. So we're going to look for things where I can send short requests that trigger large responses. Now, the thing I can do with UDP is because there's no handshake, I can do IP spoofing, which you can also do with TCP, it just doesn't work. So IP spoofing is, I say hi to Google, but instead of saying it's me, I say, oh, it's my friend Manon, right? And so I say hi to Google, and then Google says hi back to Manon, okay? So that's how it works, so that's, that's IP spoofing. Now in TCP, it doesn't work, because I say hi to Google, and Google says hi back to Manon, and Manon says, well, I never said hi to you. Right, so Manon just ignores it, whatever, okay? So in TCP, you can't, you can, you can spoof, but it's just not effective because there's this handshake, and that's why the handshake is there in TCP is actually to prevent spoofing or make sure that it's not like important. But with UDP, there's no protection on that. So I can ask, and then I, I get a response, okay? So what I do is I go out and I find some UDP server or some service that's running on UDP. So examples uh, that, that we'll look at, this is one condition, there's a second condition we need. Uh, there's something called the network time protocol where you can just ask the server, hey, what time is it? And then they'll tell you, okay? Almost every server on the internet will, will do that for you. Um, in DNS, you can also do it. And there's a new version of DNS called DNSSEC, which is more effective for the type of attack that we wanna do. Okay, so what you do is you basically go to the server and say, you know, I am server, meaning uh, we have two servers, so it's kind of confusing, but let's call this the server. So this is the target uh, of the attack. So you basically say, hi, I'm the target of the attack. I'm attacking Google. Hi, I'm Google. What time is it? Okay. Then the UDP will send the time to Google. Okay. So that in and of itself isn't that much different than I could just send stuff. I could say, what time is it? What time is it? What time is it? What time is it? And then it would say, it's 8 o'clock. It's 8 o'clock. It's 8 o'clock. Right? Um, so that, that happens. But every time I ask, like, to get it to tell it it's 8 o'clock, I have to ask for it. Right? And so I'm spending as much bandwidth asking for the time as the server is spending hitting the target of the attack. Okay? But what if my response was a lot shorter? Sorry, if my request was a lot shorter. So for example, instead of saying what time it is, one thing you could, you could do in NDP, NTP, they basically changed it now, is I forget exactly, but you could say like, what are the last thousand servers or IP addresses that ask you what time it is? Okay. And so then it would say, okay, here's a list of them, all right? Uh, now, the thing is that for me to say, what are the last 1,000, that's like a really short packet, but the list itself is huge, right, relatively. It's 10 times larger than the request. So if I'm requesting that information at a certain rate, right, then it's responding at the same rate, but with things that are 10 times as big, okay? And that's all getting directed to my target. So. Um, basically, I'm using 100% of my bandwidth to ask for, for things that have a large response, and those large responses are being hammered against the server uh, which I'm targeting. Okay, so I have a short request and a large response. So, like, it could also be DNS. So, uh, with DNS, I could be like, okay, what's, what's the IP address for Google? That's pretty short, but then the IP address for Google is also pretty short. Okay, but then what people said is for reasons that we'll actually talk about later, um, you know, DNS, what if DNS is wrong? You know, there, there's some security considerations. What we should do is we should have digital signatures 
on all DNS records. So you should get a record and then you should have a signature on it. But because the server isn't authoritated over it, it will sign what it thinks the, the answer is. But then it's going to also be signed by like the .com domain. And then it's going to be signed by VeriSign who kind of oversee the whole thing, whatever. And so you have these chains of certificates, right? And so anyways, you're just like, what's Google? What's Google? What's Google? What's Google? And now it's like, here's three certificates. Here's three certificates. Here's three certificates. And they're huge, right? And so anyway, so it's the same idea. It runs over UDP. Um, so you can do this spoofing. And so you can direct it, OK? Then you can combine it with distributed denial service. Right? So you can do your amplification attack, and you can get all your friends the botnet that you rented, and they can all do the amplification as well. Okay? So now you can like blow your bandwidth up by 10 uh, just arbitrarily. Now, these servers have to keep up, right? But servers that run NTP and DNS, they tend to be like the core internet like backbone servers, and they have a lot of bandwidth. So they tend to be servers. And there's also a lot of them. You don't have to use one server. You can pick a thousand NTP servers and, and hit them all as hard as you can and, and sort of spread it out amongst different ones, okay? So anyway, so that's, that's amplification. So um, that's kind of the more advanced version of, of denial of service. So yeah, so we, we sort of went from DOS to DDOS to amplification and then what's going to come next, who knows? Uh, the last attack is escalation of privilege or elevation of privilege. I, I usually say escalation, so I may, I may say it wrong. Um, so we, we see this a lot, uh, particularly in software vulnerabilities. You'll see it, uh, like, say, with an operating system. Uh, one thing you want to do if you want to get malware on a machine is you have to decide how you're going to get malware on it. So maybe I want to get it through a website. So you're going to come to my website, and I'm going to get malware on your machine. Well, the problem is that you know, the browser is going to render the website, but it's not going to let me like change your operating system. It's not going to let me like install software or whatever, right? And so I have to break out of the browser somehow. So just by you viewing my website, somehow, even without asking your permission, I'm able to break out of the browser and then try and install something at the operating system level. But then the operating system is going to be like, well, now we run with limited privileges. So like, you, you know, users have to type in their username and password if they want to install pass, like software that would change, you know, deep system settings, like the kind of thing that malware might want to do, right? And so then you want to break out of that and somehow, like, I'm able to install my malware as if I'm a super user on your computer, even though you're logged in as a normal user, right? So anyway, so those are all, like, little sandboxes or containers, and escalation of privilege is breaking out of those containers, right? So it's... You're, you're only privileged to do one thing or you only have access or authorization to do a limited set of things. You find some vulnerability that lets you do more than you're authorized to do. We call that an escalation of privilege attack. Yeah, so like going from limited user to a min is escalation of privilege, that, that type of thing. Okay, so that's, this is Stride, pretty simple. It's just a nice place to start. Uh, it lets you brainstorm things. So someone hands you something, you can say, okay, well, what are all the attacks that are spoofing that I can think of? What are all the tampering attacks? And it, it helps you not miss things as well. So you might, you might be so focused on the tampering attacks that you're not even thinking about the privacy information disclosure attacks. So it makes sure that you at least are kind of covering all of your bases. Any questions about Stride? Okay, we're not, we won't run an example of Stride because it's kind of too simple, but, um, but, but anyways, it was just a place to start. Okay, the next one we'll look at is called Evaluation Frameworks. And this one we will run a small example through. So once again, this is super high level. This is about comparing alternatives. I'll say for security. So it's some sort of security, some sort of security product tool, whatever it is. It might be software, it might be a way of doing things, protocol. It could be lots of different things. That's what makes it high level. Um, but anyway, th there's 10 different ways of doing it and you wanna say which one's best. That's basically an evaluation framework. Okay, 
And it's really simple, but it's, it's actually harder to do than it looks. So it looks really simple. It, you've already seen it. You just don't know it by its proper name or whatever. Um, you know, it's, it's basically just a simple chart where you have kind of like, okay, here's the first alternative, the second alternative, the third alternative. And here's some properties that it should have. It should have this property, should have this property, should have this property. And then some sort of check marks or something to show whether it actually has those properties or not. Okay, and the main reason that you use it is sometimes you use it to decide which alternative to use. Sometimes you wanna show that there's trade-offs that are involved, like there's no perfect solution. So that's the way I'm going to use it. We're going to talk about something where I think there's no perfect solution, right? And you might ask yourself, well, why isn't there a perfect solution since this is a problem that's 30 years old? Um, and, uh, you know, and so this will, will kind of uh, show, showcase it. Now, another thing that we can use to drag out of this methodology is we can show that there's more to security than security. So what do I mean by that? What I mean is, uh, let's say I give you a solution and it's, it actually is secure. It's super secure. It's way more secure than, than the other three things that you might use, okay? But no human can use it, right? It's so onerous and it's a pain to use and everyone hates it and you know people just turn it off or whatever. Did I actually solve that security problem? Not really. Like I did at one level because it was more secure but at a practical level, I didn't solve it because it, you know, no one uses it. Similarly, let's say I have a really good security property problem, or sorry, alternative, and let's say it's actually usable, everyone likes it, but it costs a million dollars per person, right? Is Concordia going to use that for all their students? No, right? So it doesn't matter. So in this case, cost, you know, is prohibitive, right? So when you do these evaluations, you want to look at not just security, but you want to look at everything. Right? So if there's something outside of security that would stop you from using it, the cost of it, the usability, whatever it is, then that's relevant as well. So you want to take those, um, you want to take those into consideration as well. So, uh, so we'll consider, usually uh, we call it the UDS framework. So usability, deployability, so that would include cost. It's not just cost, it might be like, if you have to change everybody's computer, like everybody has to install new software or like every internet server has to change one protocol, right? Like you're never gonna get every internet server to, to change, right? So that's like a deployability issue. It's not really about cost, it's just about like, you know, you're not, you're not gonna get everyone to change. Um, and then security, obviously. Okay, so the idea is to think more holistically about security. Meaning we, we think about like, at the end of the day, are people going to use this or not? Not just about like, at a strict security level, is it the best, is it the best thing? Uh, it also gives you a nice sort of presentation of information as well. So you'll do this in assignment one, you'll do one of these things. And a lot of people will do it in a project. And when I write my academic papers, if it's relevant, I usually try to include one. Um, and you know, it's a, it's a good way to summarize the related work and, and show like all the different things. So it's a nice way of presenting uh, a bunch of different material as well.
Okay, so some of the mechanics of how we do it, and then I'll run an example. So basically, we're going to have rows and we're going to have columns in the in the um, paper. Let me actually start with the rows. Okay, so the rows are going to be alternative. So the same, something that gives you basically the same result, but they're just different ways of doing it. And it can be anything like related to security for something secure, I'll just say. Solution. Yeah, solutions, maybe security, let's say for security solutions. So I'm being sort of vague just so that it doesn't lose its generality. And they should actually be alternative. So it's not like, well, you could do both, right? It's usually like, okay, you, you either do the one or you do the other, right? You don't really do both kind of thing. Um, okay, so there are alternatives uh, for security. The columns are going to be properties. And to make it easy, you can see like there's different dots. Some of these properties might be like things that you want, like, oh, this is usable, it's cheap, whatever. Or you could have a property like, oh, it's expensive. In that case, you don't want the dot. And then it becomes really hard to read the, the chart because some of the dots you want and some of them you don't, right? So what we do is we always flip the wording of the property around so it's always the thing that you want. So instead of saying it's expensive, I would say, I would flip around and say it's cheap. The cheap is what I want. Right? And so the more dots you have, the better you are. So for all columns, you, you want the dot as opposed to not want the dot. So sometimes that involves like, you know, playing with the English the way you describe it to flip it around. Um, but uh, properties, uh, they're uh, things you want. Meaning, so we phrase it at an English level, we phrase it positively. And then for each property, you'll have a dot. And you can, you can use whatever scale you want. You could use letters, numbers, whatever you want. Uh, I tend to try and keep it simple. So I like, first off, the simplest would be just sort of something binary. So it's just sort of like no dot, uh, meaning it does not fulfill what you want. And full dot means it does fulfill. And sometimes you might want a half. Sometimes you're not satisfied. Like there's there's something where it, it, it's better than a, an empty dot, but it's not quite as good as a full dot. And so optionally, you can have a kind of half dot. So it partially fulfills. then that's fine too. So you, you could alternatively have like an NA. So sometimes we have that as well. So uh, it's usually an indication that you have to rethink, like are your alternatives actually alternatives? If some of them have this thing and in some cases it's not applicable or is the property really phrased correctly, right? Like am I asking a really narrow question um, where, I mean, if some of the systems just don't, if you can't even answer it for that system, then uh, maybe that property doesn't matter, right? Be it, maybe it's optional or something like that. So NAs, sometimes they show up and in some cases they, uh, at first you should question whether you have everything right if you see them, but then you don't have to throw it away if you, if you think that you really have them. Yeah. So yeah, in some of our papers we have NAs as well. Sometimes you have special symbols for like, like this is a real killer. Like it's not just that it has no dot, but like if you don't have a dot here, you're like, it's, you might as well throw it away, it's junk. Um, or like, there's, anyways, you, you can get inventive with the symbols that you wanna use, but yeah. So for the example we'll run in class anyway, we'll, we'll think about like a sort of, we'll try and actually do everything binary and then I'll show you a few examples of, of kind of half dots. Okay, so for every column, 
you have a property that you want, uh, you're going to have some scale uh, for, for what the dot means. And then what you have to do is you have to say, uh, like, not just the name of the column, because sometimes it's not clear from the name alone what exactly you mean. So you should say, like, a sentence or two, like, what does the column mean? And for that specific thing, like say it's like, oh, it's cheap. Okay, well, what does that mean? Like cheap, what does cheap mean? Well, like it has monetary value, right? And then I'm like, okay, if you give a full dot, what is that? That means it's cheap, but what does that mean? Like, like so you might say, well, it's under $5. And it's a partial dot if it's under $100 and it's a full, no dot if it costs $1,000 or more or whatever, you know? So you wanna be specific, not just about what the column means, but then you wanna get in specifically about what does it mean to get a full dot what does it mean to get a partial dot? What does it mean to get no dot? And you're going to do that because every column will be different. You're going to have to repeat it for every column. So it can be a bit tedious to write these things out because you have to have a sentence about every row and about every column and then about what every dot means in every column. And then you have to do the actual evaluation and say, well, I'm giving this system a, a half dot because blah, blah, blah. And, you know, and so anyway, these things can, they, you'll see some examples uh, maybe next class where I'll show you actual academic papers and you can see how detailed they get even for something that's relatively simple. But anyway. Uh, So I, I'll just note that by phrase it positively, I mean that, that a full dot is the best, is best score. Okay, so let's, let's run an example uh, for this. So the example I'm gonna use are passwords and alternatives. So basically, what are some alternatives to passwords? What's the best one, right? What's the best alternative? If we don't like passwords, almost no one, no one likes passwords, right? And so what are the best ones? Okay, okay, lots of shutting up. All right, uh, so I, I will take all the things you can think of. So we'll start with passwords. Uh, the one that, the reason I asked you the question at the start of class is uh, we have uh, two-factor authentication, uh, which is called, so sometimes it's called multi-factor authentication. I'm going to, we'll do it like, because as you'll see, when you evaluate it, it might matter. Like, is it multi-factor or two-factor? And is it two-factor with your authenticator app or is it with your phone? Like those details might change the scoring. So I'm just going to do one you could do a bunch of them, but we'll just, we'll pretend it's the simplest one probably, which is uh, SMS. You get some sort of code over SMS. Okay, what are other ones that people were shutting up? Face ID. Okay, okay, okay. All right, so face ID is uh, what we call biometrics. Uh, so it could be a fingerprint, face ID, that kind of thing. So I'll call it biometrics. Face ID, iris scan, that kind of thing. And once again, we'll we'll just we'll think about fingerprints, just to pick one. You could do you could do all of them, but we'll we'll just pick one and we'll do fingerprints. Okay, someone said OAuth. Um, so OAuth is uh, an example of uh, more generally of what we call single sign-on. Um, so Facebook, Connect, Google ID, whatever, all these types of things are single sign-on. So the idea here is that you, uh, instead of logging in, creating a new username and password for the website that you just visited, uh, what you're going to do instead is you're, you already have an account with Facebook, so you'll just use it. So I'm going to log into Facebook. Facebook's going to send a message to the game that I want to play saying, this person is logged in, this is their username and whatever. Uh, and then they don't have to manage, the, what, the game doesn't have to manage the identities, uh, they're managed, sort of, they're farmed out, okay? 
So we'll think about kind of the Facebook model. It could be Apple, it could be Google, all of them have this. Why do they have them? Why does Facebook do this? Yeah, exactly, okay? So it's, it costs Facebook money, right? Because now every time you log in, right, Facebook has to pay for that bandwidth, right? Yet Google and Apple and everyone's putting, you know, jumping up and down trying to get you to use their, them as their like identity provider. And the answer is data, okay? What data do they get? Well, every time you play the game, Facebook gets a message. Every time you go to a website and you're logged in, there's a ping, the website has to ping Facebook to see who you are. Facebook learns that, right? So they're learning what games you're playing, they're learning what websites you're visiting, they're learning how frequently you're visiting them, right? Uh, and all that is super useful data if you are a data broker, right? Um, and so anyway, so that's why, and they'll, they'll provide it for free, even though it costs them a lot in terms of bandwidth and servers and things like that. Okay, what are other ones? Okay, so some sort of keys. Um, so you can say private key. So this could be like a client certificate, that kind of thing. Uh, so the difference between this and a password is a password you know in your head, a key you don't know because it's too big and long to memorize, generally speaking. Okay. Uh, so a key you would write down. Where are you going to write it down? Well, you're going to write it down on your computer uh, in a file, right? So there's going to be a file sitting on your computer. Now, maybe you wrap that file in a password, so that's common. So now you have a password and a certificate. Um, well, I'll just consider the case where it's, it's sort of in plain text. So there's just a file with it on your computer, and we'll evaluate it in that perspective. But... Um, so the idea of a client certificate also is it's fully automated, right? So you go to a website and sometimes the, for permission's sake, so you're not like blabbing your certificate to everyone, they, it might ask you your browser, but basically you just go, you click a button and then you're logged in. You don't have to type anything in. Um, so SSH works, it's probably the most common example of something that maybe you've used that, that has a client certificate based model. So if you have that file, it's in the right folder on your computer, then you just type the command and it does all the authentication automatically. Okay, what else? Okay, so security questions I'm gonna put over here as, uh, these are kinda like, I call them password adjacent. So they don't, they're not a true alternative to passwords. What they are is they're a recovery mechanism. So I forgot my password, then I do it uh, as a way to recover. Sometimes they're thrown as almost like a second factor. So in that case, you could maybe list them here. Uh, but, but anyways, I, I consider them more of like a recovery thing. So you could do a whole evaluation framework on what's the best way to recover your passwords. Do I use social authentication like your friends? Like Facebook had this thing where like you would, it would show you a bunch of pictures and you had to say which ones were actually your friends and then it would like log you in and things like that. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so anyway, so password recovery. But what I would encourage you to do is consider that as a separate kind of category, but in the paper that we show, you'll see that they actually merge them together. So they look at the alternatives and the recovery, but they're in a special thing. Okay, anything else anyone can think of? Okay, uh, so tokens, uh, tags, RFID, that kind of thing. So uh, yeah, we'll, we'll call them tokens. I'll use, once again, I'll drill down and use a specific example. Um, so I'm gonna use what's called an RSA token. But these are examples of, of hardware. Does anyone know what an RSA token is? It's a little device that plays the time by one time password. It can be kind of the six digits. Okay, okay. So it's something that you normally would have on your keychain, like an actual physical device you carry around with it. It has a number on it. The number changes either on a time-based cycle or some of them you advance it, like you press it every time you want to log in. Um, the number is just like two-factor authentication. So you still log in with your username, your password, and now you have this second code. But instead of it being texted to you on your phone, you're looking at like some key fob thing that you have and it has the number, okay? Now the RSA server has to have the number two, right? Otherwise it won't know. How does it know what's the number on your device? And so basically they have like this random number generator that's the same on their server and on the device. So they're synchronized 
and they both go through the same numbers in the same order. And if it gets out of sync a bit, like you use one that was from like two minutes ago, then the server usually will forgive it and say, okay, but that is a number. It's not the current one I'm looking at, it's, but it's not too old. And then it will resynchronize uh, to it. So anyway, so we'll talk about these later when we talk about social engineering, because uh, there was actually a cool social engineering attack uh, on these. Um, but, but anyways, that's, that's basically, it's basically a two-factor authentication, but instead of a phone, it's like some, like, something that, that, you, uh, that you have like on your keychain or whatever. Okay, anything else? Does this name have the authentication last thing on Yeah, so authenticator and RS, so these, I would say, uh, receiving a one-time password over SMS, it's not even, one-time one password usually is like literally just the one password. So in this case, it's, it's a second, kind of code or whatever, like you still have a, a user chosen password. But it's it, the, the only difference between the three of them is the vehicle with which you receive it, right? So if you receive it over SMS, that's one thing. If you receive it through the Authenticator app, then it's being served over the internet. But the idea is that they only make the app for a phone. So that's how they enforce that it's, like if you had the app on your computer and you were already typing the username in on, on the computer, it's not really an extra factor, kind of. Um, uh, but anyways, but it's at least your unique computer or whatever. Yeah. So anyways, you get over an app and then the RSA thing is something that's in your pocket, right? Now the big difference is with SMS, uh, first off, it's a completely different channel. So your username and password are going over HTTPS. Let's say the adversary somehow is able to intercept HTTPS. If you're getting the code also over HTTPS, then there's a chance that they can, they can intercept that as well. Right? So by getting it over SMS, you're getting over a completely separate protocol. So that's sort of like more secure in that sense. Now the problem with it is it's probably easier to steal. You can steal someone's SMS. You can steal their phone number, right? Uh, you, you've heard of uh, SIM swapping attacks and things like that. And you can do it through social engineering. You can just call up, pretend to be someone else. Uh, and so there's ways to, um, to deal with that. Uh, then you, uh, yeah, so, so in that case, it's kind of weaker. The other thing is you might be somewhere where th there's no cell signal, but you have internet, right? Like in the uh, Fauberg building when I was writing the exam last week, a couple weeks ago before Christmas. Uh, yeah, that was the situation I was in. So I literally couldn't log into Concordia because I couldn't get cell service, but I had Wi-Fi, right? And so in that case, having the authenticator app is, is better. Also, it like pollutes your text messages. <laughs> So now when I go to my text messages, like half of them are single sign-on things and half of them are text messages with other people and you have to like comb through them all. So that as well. Okay. Uh, oh, and also the Authenticator app, uh, you can also just click. So both RSA and, and two-factor, you'd have to type the number in. With Authenticator, you can just click on it and say, I authorize it. And then it does it all without copying a number. It depends on how it works. So at Google Authenticator used to give you the number and then you would type it in. I don't know, I haven't used it, but Microsoft Authenticator, you just click, basically. Yeah. Sorry? Sorry? Authenticator allows the password. Sorry? Okay, okay, yeah. Okay. And it does as well, yeah. Okay, is there anything else we missed here? I think we got a pretty complete list. Okay, uh, cookies are sort of uh, password, I'll say password adjacent. Uh, we'll spend a lot of time at the end of the course talking about cookies. They're more about keeping you logged in once you've supplied your password. So I supply my password, now I'm logged in. How does the website know it's me that keeps coming back? And they don't keep asking me for the password. So cookies are, are sort of what maintains that. Someone said something else. Default. Sorry? E Default. Where is that? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. So graphical passwords is what I think of them as. So a graphical password is a password. It's just not in letters and alphanumeric characters. Uh, it's some sort of pattern. So like the swipe, the Android unlock is the most famous example of it. People have done experiments. It never really broke out of academia where they would like show you a grid like a picture that had like kind of grid and you would click on things. And then if you remember like what you clicked on, 
uh, then you would, could come back and you could click on the same things and that would be your password instead. And uh, sometimes it's used in the password adjacent sort of column, uh, it's sometimes used as a, actually kind of a reverse authentication. So when you log in, they show you a picture back that's supposed to represent some security picture that you showed. And that's meant to combat like phishing, although it's too late because you already put your password in anyways. But, um, but the idea is that you might know that, oh, I'm on a fake banking site because they're not showing me the right picture in the, the opposite direction. So that never really caught on, but I feel like I've seen it a few times in the last couple, five years or so. Um, but anyways, okay, I think we did pretty good. Uh, oh, there's one other thing uh, which I'll, I'll put is, which is actually the thing that I use now that, that's the uh, probably, in my mind, the best solution is a password manager. So a password manager is something that you know is going to store your passwords for you. It might choose them for you as well. Uh, sometimes it comes with a master password. So you still have to remember one password, which is your master password that unlocks your password manager, but then all your uh, passwords themselves are stored. So um, I'll, we'll consider, we'll evaluate it in the case that it has a master password. But you could also, there are some that don't have a master password either. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. So that could be biometrics, I would say. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll put that also under password adjacent. So that's usually used. Um, it's usually not a sole, it's not used solely to authenticate, like it wouldn't authenticate you just because of that. But usually it's used in the opposite sense of like, hey, you just gave me the right username and password, so normally I let you in. But it's really weird because you were just in Montreal five seconds ago and now you're somewhere else, right? And you know how could you be in those two places at the same time? So that looks suspicious. So, um, or maybe you, you have the right session cookie, right? So you have the session cookie, but you're in a completely different location. So I'm gonna make you log in again. Even though you technically your session cookie is still valid, I'm going to force you to log in. Or if you're logging in, I might ask you the security questions or whatever at that point. Um, so I might throw some extra layer of, uh, of security on top. So yeah, so that's usually where this is used. It's not used as a sole um, thing. And then there's, there, there's also things that like, um, uh, uh, okay, so yeah, so CAPTCHAs is another thing. So CAPTCHA is, usually to stop some sort of automated attack. So it's usually, you see it more often at registration, so it's more about stopping automated registration, but it could also be some sort of password, online password cracking attempt. So if you retry your password too many times and you keep typing the wrong one in, then first off, it generally just slows down, right? So the site will, it will take a really long time to reload, but then it might throw a CAPTCHA on for good luck as well. Um, the other thing I was going to say is there's something called, uh, forgetting the name of it, uh, uh, implicit authentication. So this is also something that's more in the academic literature, but the idea would be like, it's kind of a biometric, but like if I'm using my phone, sort of the way I hold it, or if I like, the way I type or like the way I rotate the phone as I'm typing, like little things like that. The phone's just sort of like, okay, this feels like Jeremy's using it, right? Like it's sort of consistent with this past behavior. And then if it changed dramatically, then it might like start asking me for usernames or passwords. Android, yeah. I think Android has a version of that where they uh, get the Bluetooth devices around to see if you're like at those or away. Right, 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 yeah. So that's another way too, yeah. So you could look at the signals where you are and things like that. Um, Another thing is like the Apple Watch, for example, I put it on in the morning, I put my password in. So it's actually a password based. But then it has like some sensors. And so as long as it never leaves my skin, then it will never ask me for my password again, right? But as soon as I take it off and I break that contact and put it on again, or someone else puts it on, right? Then it asks for a password right away, right? So it has that sort of implicit authentication it still authenticates once. It's more like maintaining a session. It's kind of like a cookie in that sense, but anyways. 
Okay, so these are kind of like our our uh, our uh, different alternatives. So we did pretty well. And then what we can do is we can think about okay, what what's the best one? So everyone kind of hates passwords, at least the way you're supposed to use a password. So here's the way you're supposed to use a password. You're supposed to go to a website. You're supposed to choose some really random looking thing, right? And it should you shouldn't reuse your password across any different websites, right? So you have a hundred different accounts or a thousand different accounts. You need a thousand different passwords. They should all be long. They should have special characters and capital letters and all of that type of stuff, right? And oh, you shouldn't write them down, right? That's bad. Um, you know, whatever. You shouldn't have like some rule for remembering it. You should, you know, you just have to maintain all of this stuff in your brain, right? Now, of course, nobody can do that, right? And so we know that passwords are bad, and that's why we we have all of these alternatives. And it's kind of crazy that we actually have like you've probably used all of these things on the list. Maybe there's like like maybe you've never used an RSA token or a client certificate, but you I bet everyone in this room has used five of these eight or six of these eight, right? And that's pretty crazy. Like, why, why, why don't we just use one? Like, everyone agrees that passwords are bad, so why doesn't everyone just use 2FA now, right? Why do we even have password managers and graphical passwords and things like that and biometrics, right? Or why are some people using biometrics and some people are using swipe patterns? You know, like, why, why is there no winner, right? Why, you know, what, what is the problem? And so it indicates that probably there's some trade-offs here. There probably isn't a winner. There's none, none of these are, are actually better than everything else. Some of them are more secure in some senses. Uh, like two-factor is strictly more secure than just a password alone, right? But yet there's lots of websites that just use a password. And I asked you and you said, well, uh, it's, it's, you know, the usability sucks, right? You don't want to pull out your phone and be typing it in for everything, right? So that's the answer, right? So it's like, do you want security or do you want usability? You got to choose. Okay, so that's what an evaluation framework is meant to do is we want to pick out these key properties, right? The usability of it, the security of it. And then we want to show that there's no system that kind of gets a dot across the whole thing, okay? There's always some columns where it's not going to get a dot. And there's not a lot of systems where like um, this system has like a subset of the dots of the next system. So like this system is actually strictly better. Like usually if you add dots in some column, you take dots away in another column. That's the other thing that tends to happen as well, okay? So an evaluation framework is, is a good way of, of, uh, of showing this. So in order to do it, we need the, the columns or the properties or the criteria. And as I mentioned, you don't have to do it this way, but it's common now in the academic literature uh, that we sort of cluster our properties into three. Uh, so usability, deployability, and security. And this is sometimes called UDS framework. So we can quickly brainstorm a couple of these. I'm not gonna do every property that we come up with, but I'll, I'll pick a few the next class uh, to, to go through. But for now, we can just like kind of roughly think about what, what we think would be like things that would fit into these categories. Okay, so just to start us off, we talked about, uh, so the very first thing I showed you was the two-factor authentication, okay? Now we said it's better on security and it's worse on usability. That was the consensus, right? So first off, why is it better on security? Okay, so it's harder to break or guess is the term I'd use. So there's sort of like more randomness, more ent entropy. If you wanna do a brute force attack, it's gonna be harder, so. Okay, and why is that good? So adding an extra layer isn't good in and of itself, right? Otherwise you would add 100 layers, right? But like what, what is it about the extra layer that makes it good? Yeah, 
Okay, so we, yeah, so we don't have a concentrated uh, point of failure. So that, that, maybe that's the best way of putting it. Okay, so no, I'm just trying to think if there's, there's a better way of phrasing it. Um, Yeah, I, th I think it just reduces to this because if if you have a single point of failure, it's just easier to guess because you just have to guess one thing as opposed to guessing two things. So I think it's already captured in, in hard to, harder to guess. Um, okay, let's try the usability side. So why is it better in terms, or why is it worse in terms of usability? Okay, so it's slow, why, why is it slow? More steps Okay, there's more steps. Um, so, uh, and then, more steps involved is a negative, so let's flip it around. So let's say less, like what's the less steps involved, like how, how would you say that exactly if you wanted a column? Okay, so, so uh, what, what is the step itself? What am I doing in that step? Taking another device. Okay, so I'm taking a device, I'm taking it whatever, out of my pocket, I'm looking at it, I'm typing it into my computer, Right, that's the type of thing. So let's break it down into two things. So one thing is I have to type something extra, okay? So we might say like there's nothing to type, to put it positively, okay? So imagine there's a password system where you never have to type anything, okay? So client certificates, for example, would be a solution like that, okay? If you have to type one thing, a password, then maybe that's a half dot, and you have to type three things, then that's, you know, or two things like your password and your whatever, um, yeah. Uh, another way we could say is physically eff effortless, meaning like you don't have to, it's, it's less specific than typing. The problem with typing is, what about a biometric? Well, there's nothing to type, but you do do something that's different than typing. So physically effortless is kind of maybe a better way of putting it, but anyways. Um, the other thing is, okay, I take it out of my pocket, that's fine. So th there's the physical effort of taking it out of my pocket, but it's gotta be in my pocket there in the first place, right? What if I forget it at home? right, then I, I can't do it, right? Um, so we might say nothing to carry, nothing new to carry. So with traditional passwords, there's nothing, to, I carry around the passwords in my head, they're already there, okay? If I give you an RSA token, you gotta carry that around with you, right? So it's something extra in your pocket, you don't have it, you can't log in, okay? It's not something you're carrying around already, your phone at least you're carrying around probably already. Right? So we might say, well, passwords, they get a full dot on nothing new to carry because you don't have to carry anything. You're carrying your head anyways. Phone is kind of like a half dot. Like you do have to carry it, but you're probably carrying it anyways. Right? Um, so that's sort of like a half dot. And an RSA token would be like no dot because it's like this whole new thing that you don't normally carry around that now you have to carry around. Okay? Now on the topic of RSA tokens, what's another drawback in terms of you got to carry it around, right? It also costs something, right? So if Concordia wants to give you all RSA tokens, right? Is there, you know, what, what's the drawback of that? It's so it's expensive, there's the cost. There's like, actually like you would have to go in person and get it. Like you have, you know, 10,000 students that are all showing up wanting their RSA tokens. I'd have to like register it with your account. So there's a lot of like friction involved in like so, okay, so that's what deployability means. So deployability is sort of like, how easy is this to deploy? Okay, so we want things that are free, or let's say cost nothing. So that, that's the positive. So in this case, it doesn't get that because it costs something. Say no change to user accounts. So if I have to go and change every single user account and add a new serial number of an RSA token, someone has to do that, right? Um, another thing you would have to do is you have to put up a server, right? So there's some new server that's gonna take these RSA things and figure out if it's right or relay it to RSA, the company or whatever, right? Uh, so some solutions, if I have to change every server on the internet in order to make my new authentication scheme work, right? Then that's, that's not a good solution, right? Um, so no change to servers. I'll say accounts or devices. So it could be their data, it could be their devices. Right, if everyone has to install a new app, right, that's a little different than 
if I can show you a website and you can do it through the website, then that's fine. But now you have to go get Microsoft Authenticator app. And oh, by the way, they, they have an Android version and a Microsoft version, but they don't have an Apple one. That's not true. They do have one. But like, you know, those, those are the kinds of things that, that might happen. Or someone has some old Nokia phone or something that doesn't, it doesn't work on. Right? You make a change to everybody's, everything that everyone does. Uh, that, that's a problem. Okay, uh, in terms of security, so some of these things are harder to guess, uh, so that's fine. Uh, what would you say is the, the most secure? If you just care about security, you don't care about cost, you don't care about usability. Okay, so ironically, I would say that they're actually not that secure, but we'll talk about that. Um, but anyways, what is it about the biometric that makes it more secure? Okay, okay. So. Uh, what we'll do is we'll, we'll go back to like spoofing, right, from Stride. And so spoofing is like impersonating someone else, okay? So the, if I wanted to phrase it, I would say that uh, a biometric is hard to impersonate, right? Now, we can argue about whether that's true or not, right? Let's say I lift your fingerprint off a glass, and then I go 3D print like a rubber finger that has your fingerprint on it, right? And I make it in a slightly conductive material. It might actually be pretty easy to steal, Right? So they're not necessarily true, but that is the vision. Um, so it's hard to impersonate. Whereas if you're using passwords, if I know you very well, I might know what your password is. Right? I might have a good guess. I would have a better than average guess for you than an, some adversary that doesn't know who you are. Um, so um, whereas I don't know anything about your fingerprint, for example, or your iris. Um, so hard to impersonate. Or I, I think they say, res I'll try and standardize it the terminology, resilient to impersonation attacks. Okay, uh, harder to guess, maybe, maybe there's more entropy in a, a fingerprint than a password, maybe not, we'll talk about it. Client certificates would be the best, or private keys, they would have the most entropy, so we sort of cover that. Um, Uh, okay, another thing about uh, biometrics is, let's say I'm standing over your shoulder watching everything you do. Can I steal your credential? What about a password? Okay, so uh, shoulder surfing is what we call that. So it could be resilient to... Uh, we'll call it uh, external observation. It might be that I'm in more physical security. If I can get a picture, like say you're a security guard and you have your keys like on your belt or whatever like they do in the movies, and I see the security camera, if I can just get a picture of the key, then that's good enough, right? I can 3D print that exact key and steal it, right? So any kind of physical observation, I'm looking over your shoulder. Um, but there's also internal observation or electronic observation. So the simplest way to steal a password, arguably, I'll call it internal. Uh, so this means in the computer. So it could be malware, that kind of thing. Um, but one last story before we go. Uh, this happened at Concordia. So one day the librarians were walking around in the Concordia library and they noticed that all the computers, not all of them, but a bunch of the public computers that anyone can walk up and use to use, they, uh, the keyboard was plugged into the computer, but there was a tiny little dongle that was, you know, a USB dongle that sat between, basically it plugged into the dongle and then the dongle plugged into the computer and it was a keystroke logger. Okay, so every single key that was pressed on that keyboard, it just got recorded on a little file and it was just like a little USB thing. It was really small, you wouldn't even notice that it was there. And then anybody, you could program it, I guess, to dump it on the network uh, or someone could come by later. They could put it there for a week, come by later, take it off, and then, and then uh, dump the file off of the actual uh, device itself. So all you do is you go and you look for, like you're gonna see all sorts of garbage, right? Cause it's like everything that was ever pressed, but you go and you search for like at concordia.ca, which is usually someone typing their username in, right? And then the next thing is probably gonna be their password or whatever, okay? So now if I have a, a client certificate, right? In that case, a keystroke logger, there's nothing to type, right? So that's, it doesn't matter. I could have a keystroke logger. You're not going to get my password, 
right? Same with a fingerprint if you want to be really strict about it being a keystroke logger. But if it's some sort of malware that's stealing all data, right, then it would grab the, the digitization of your fingerprint as well type of thing. So we can think about this internal observation as well. So anyway, these are a set of properties. We'll come back next class and we'll pick a couple of them and we'll actually evaluate the systems using that.